day six today looks a bit misty out there this morning but today we're going to have a look at Crac de Chevalier which is not far away as you know but we're going to stop on the way at the Monastery of St George which is even nearer in fact it's just down the road yes St George again it's nice that they think so much of our national saint round here this is a working monastery a few parts still intact date from medieval times but most of it is built during the last hundred years our hotel keeper is the priest here unfortunately something has gone wrong with the arrangements and we don't see inside it is Sunday after all and the morning service is in session so we pack up and make a start towards Crack de Chevalier. We are soon in the village of Alhosen, just below the castle. We had a couple of little difficulties getting into the castle, nothing compared to those trying to capture it in the good old days of course. Also this village we call it a class village. Here you will see the castle coming into view just above us. Our first little difficulty was this car which didn't seem to want to move. And the next difficulty was that there was a car parked right on this next hairpin bend as you will see. There was little altercation between our driver and that driver which has been censored but uh, apart from that we arrived safely at the castle. You know how some people are always trying to get into the picture? Well I think by the way that this is up to Hollywood standard. It's brilliant and I think you will be probably nominated for an Oscar. You mean to be in this film don't you? I can see what you're doing. Now then just look at this here and this is just the gatehouse located on the right of that plan. If we did manage to get anywhere near the gate we then have to go through this tunnel right through the thickness of the walls. There are four gates, there are people shooting through holes at the side of us and dropping things on us from the top. If we did get through there we're just inside the outer walls. The castle is still there. So what we're going to do now is walk along this chamber which stretches along the southern walls of the castle which is believed to have been used as stables. Oh there's somebody else at it now look. What's happening now? There's always tourists in the way, aren't they? Yeah. Bloody tourists. And where they gone? I don't know where they've gone to be honest. And where they had gone was up the stairs in the tower we were in, which brought us out on top of the outer walls. So whilst we have a walk round these outer walls, can I just mention that there is archaeological evidence to suggest that the Egyptians occupied this site during their struggle for this area with the Hittites. 
This culminated in the Battle of Kadesh in 1285 BC, which I think involved Ramesses II, if I remember correctly. Now we're still exploring the space outside the castle itself and eventually we'll arrive at the gateway to the inner castle. If you had made it this far, and I don't think anybody ever did, then forcing an entry through this gateway would be just as difficult as the outer one I should imagine. Having gained entry, we'll have a look at the Great Hall. Perhaps you'll agree that especially this part of the building wouldn't look out of place in northern France. An inscription here says, Grace, wisdom and beauty you may enjoy, but beware pride which may alone tarnish all the rest. Give you something to think about. The Crusaders had arrived in the early 12th century and in 1144 the Knights Hospitallers took over this castle, whereupon they completely refortified it. Saladin's castle did not go through this phase. The crack was never taken in battle, but during the 13th century the Crusader presence in the Holy Land began to thin out and crack was left in the end with about 200 men as a garrison. It could hold 4,000. Then in 1271 Sultan Baibars began a siege of the castle. Sultan Baibars was the leader of the Mamluks who were spreading from Egypt and taking over Syria. A section of this building was converted to a mosque and after Yasser has shown us the minbar a local gentleman will demonstrate the acoustics. When Baibars attacked, the outer wall was breached. The inner defences, however, proved to be impregnable, even with the reduced and dejected garrison. Eventually, Baibars sent in a forged letter purporting to be from the big chief of the hospitalers based at Tripoli. This letter advocated surrender and the garrison readily accepted the Sultan's offer of safe passage to the sea. Within 20 years the rest of the Crusader presence on the coast would also be gone. We've come up another level now and very shortly we'll be on top of the highest tower in the castle. The castle remained in use during the Mamluk period but as the foreign threats receded its strategic importance lessened. The crack is not the largest of the Crusader castles, but being the most intact, it conveys a far greater impression of size than the others. So we're now at the highest point in the castle. There's looking back to where we were a few moments ago. That's looking down on the outer walls which looked so high up from outside and there are the feudal peasants down below. The most recent major alteration was in 1934 when the French Mandates Antiquities Department cleared out the village and the villages which had grown up inside the castle. 